<laughs> I think that that has got, you know, that's, uh, he's, he's not right about that. I think he will be hiding when these things come out. I'm sure he will be um, keeping a keeping a distance, really. I, I, I'm going to ask you one last question, then we'll open it up to the floor here. Um, how do then, you know, when you're writing so much in your columns, certainly um, from your life, how do you negotiate what's on and off limits? Like what, um, what kinds of deals do you make with your family? I have a friend who says, my family, or as I like to refer to them, my material. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, well, it is quite tricky. Um, he hates me to mention him at all. So he's become this character called himself. He's just kind of, <laughs> he comes in and delivers pungent one-liners and then wanders off. Um, I don't know. I think you can't, as a, as a columnist, you know, obviously what's, what the kids are saying and uh, coming in and out. And uh, I, did a, I did a column a while ago because I think I'm such a kind of hopeless technophobe. And I had this old mobile cell phone, which I loved. I absolutely loved it. But they called it the Flintstone phone because it was so embarrassing and it was so ancient. So mm -hmm. then we have the thing about, you know, and then they come in and they see me do something. And they say, why are you doing that the wrong way, the long way around? And I said, this is the only way I know that. You know, so I think, you know, but yeah, of course there would be certain things. Mm -hmm. um, the worst thing that's happened in the last year, apart from the depression, was my son Googled and found my piece about my depression ah, and that was not very good mm -hmm. and I didn't see that one coming hmm. so that's required a lot of mummy's fine really having the conversation yeah there, there was a great column you wrote about your son being stuck in New York during a snowstorm in British Airways and I thought that is the power of the columnist you can write damn you British Airways to uh, get your son please back bring Christmas. him please bring him home <laughs> Yeah, I managed to I managed to get all this uh, kind of press attention and they went out um, and they were interviewing them and Thomas was meant to be looking forlorn and longing to come home but he'd never seen a more cheerful looking child on camera. He just went, he just went hi mum, I'm fine. <laughs> just looking like tiny Tim with kind of, you know, it was absolutely hopeless but uh, um, I don't know. But um, no, it's great. I mean, my, my daughter's read this and she said I can really relate. So I think that Anyone who thinks I wasn't a Debbie Cassidy fan, it's, it's not really about Debbie Cassidy. Mm -hmm. It's about all kinds of love and friendship and female friendship. How, when you're 13, girl friendship can feel totally volatile and unsafe. But I don't know if I speak for you as well, but when you get older, your friends, your girlfriends become really the kind of Mm -hmm. One of the great bedrock of your life, really. Thing that keeps you going. Things that yeah, keeps you that going. That lasts through all your other relationships, yes. really. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. My great friend who helped me, one of the friends who helped me with, I don't know how she does it, who was one of the friends who was emailing me all the comments about what was happening. She's a working mom. She works in, um, she works in TV. And I saw her the other day, and um, Aileen in the movie has created a friend for Kate Reddy who's called Alison, my spelling. And uh, to my great delight, she's going to be played by Christina Hendricks from Mad Men. <laughs> <laughs> but Hillary, my friend, said, she said, no, she said, uh, you're Kate Reddy. She said, so you're Sarah Jessica Parker. She said, and I'm your friend, so I'm Christina Hendricks. So, this was, <laughs> <laughs> so all my friends now are going to claim to be being played by Christina Hendricks anyway. I think it'd be pretty great to be played by either one of them, really. Absolutely. Yes, it's so exciting. It's anyway, so exciting. Does, does anyone have questions? We'll open it up to questions from the audience now. Hi. Hi. Um, I love Thank you. I'm wondering if um, in this age of celebrity overshare, where you know, we can go online and Google Charlie Sheen's porn dates and, and so much, so much information about, about celebrities, does that change the nature of the teen idol? It's not, it's hard to have a pristine yeah. love affair when you're reading that so-and-so may have had a threesome with X and Y. So do, yeah. does it change it in this age? I, I think it does, even though I think that my daughter and her friends, that their, um, I think their crushes are still surprisingly romantic. Um, but I, I, I do take the point. When, when I was researching I Think I Love You, I actually bought David Cassidy's autobiography called Come On, Get Happy. And uh, it's, you know, my God. I mean, it, it's uh, pretty explicit. He's very honest about what he went through. And I wasn't shocked as a whatever I was when I read it, 40 year old woman. I wasn't shocked. I mean, it was pretty much what you'd expect groupies and, you know, just all kinds of stuff, really. Um, 
but the kind of girl inside me was still that kind of child was like absolutely David oh my god yeah put her down you know it was kind of really was so so yeah I think maybe so although I think that they still um I don't know Justin Bieber has not been they ca- I think they catch the boys young enough yeah yes. the Justin Bieber's of the they're world they're probably gonna have to get younger and younger aren't they probably have to be like seven or something to be <laughs> to be uh... <laughs> But, but um, a, 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 a movie agent told me that the power of the teen, the teen market now is such that it's one of probably the major driver in Hollywood. So this thing I'm writing about, not only is it a huge start of a human passion, but it's a huge commercial thing. And one of the things I do try and say in the book, the book does have some satirical purpose, really, because when I went back and looked at all the magazines that we were reading, and just, it's just extraordinary. You're encouraged as a young girl to feel as bad about yourself as is humanly possible. It's kind of like, identify your weak points, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How, how you could look better. And then on about page 45, it says, how to have confidence in yourself. And you think, not by reading this magazine. <laughs> you start. And I'm trying to say to Evie, my daughter, um, you know, lo- lovely, 15. I mean, youth is lovely, isn't it? You know, and uh, I say to her, you know, and now I wish I'd gone around with a, with a huge kind of placard saying, ha ha, I've got a 23 inch waist. Yeah. Instead of which I was wearing these long droopy, you know, that terrible kind of cardigans and the mm-hmm. just sort of, you know, feeling, feeling I didn't look nice. You think, oh, you should have done it then. So, mm-hmm. so it's partly about that. And there's a lot about mothers and daughters as well, isn't there? Mm-hmm. And, and, and as you say, the friends who make you feel better about yourself versus the friends who make you feel worse about yourself. And one of the great uh, rites of passage for women, which doesn't seem to be true for men, who all kind of have this way of duking it out on the playing fields and then all, you know, yes. snapping towels at each other in the shower room. But you do sort of graduate as a woman from trying to be with the friend who makes you feel bad about yourself. Yes. You call the Jillian character our son. Um, yeah. S-U-N. Trying to, trying to attract the attention of the girls with whom you cannot be yourself. And in fact, it would be better to not be yourself and who end up making you feel lonelier. There's a little, there's a, just a, can I read this small, yeah. small bit here? This is, this is my paragraph summing up what Joanna's thing. This is Petra reflecting on the group she's now got access to. You chose the kind of friends you wanted because you, could, you hoped you could be like them and not like you. To improve your image, you made yourself more stupid and less kind. As the months passed, the trade-off for belonging started to feel too great. The shutting down of some vital part of yourself, just so you could be included on a shopping trip into town, not have to sit on your own at lunch, or have someone to walk home with. Now among friends, you are often lonelier than you had been before. The hierarchy of girls, so much more brutal than that of boys. The boys battled for supremacy out on the pitch, and after, they showered away the harm. The girls played dirtier. For the girls, it was never just a game. So that's yeah, I think that's beautiful. And it is kind of rite of passage that when you give up on those girls and you gravitate toward the people who actually are your friends, I think that's such a mark of having grown up. There was a question in the back. Yes, hi. I just wanted to tell you, first of all, that I was married to Paul McCartney for a year. Um, he he in- ran me down in his Aston Martin. <laughs> and- I was in a wheelchair, and uh, so he took me home and adopted me. Anyway, so you've brought all that joyful time back. Um, I just wondered if, because you're a columnist, so you write in your own voice naturally, if you had ever considered, your de- you, you, you decided you wanted to write about this material about teenagers, did you ever consider writing it as a memoir in, in your own, in kind of your columnist voice? And if not, what is the difference between the way you write as a columnist and the way you write as a novelist? What kind of imagination and skill are you using that's, that's different? Um, very good question. Um, I'm not sure I have the answer. Uh, no, I, I, wa- I wanted to write it as a novel. I thought, I think you can just, the richness of the topic, you can refract it through so many different voices and um, you've got the Bill voice, this is the, the male journalist and so on. And it's, uh, I think a memoir, it's not my story. I mean, it's, it's a tiny fraction of me. Um, I just thought, you know, a novel, you can bring so many ideas into play and so much richness. Um.